Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 539 featuring Alan Miranda and Luke Skull. Now I don't know about you, but when I think about tabletop role playing, two things come to mind. <laughs> One, a big honking bag of dice, because it's a dice game. Uh, and then also miniatures, because miniatures are cool and awesome and you get to paint them and they look super cool on the tabletop. Well, why don't we see the same sort of thing uh, in computer versions? There's been some games with dice and some games, with, you know, of course, with the <laughs> uh, graphics where you can see the characters. But uh, has there been one that really tried to make a conscious effort to capture that magic of the miniatures and the dice? Uh, I can't really think of any. Uh, so I'm really excited about their project here. Uh, now, they've got 18 days left on this Kickstarter, or maybe less, depending on when you're watching this video. They're trying to get to $368,147. Uh, that's adapted from the Canadian money. Uh, but if you do the math, that's about 37% shy of the mark. Uh, so they really need your help to get their Kickstarter over the edge and into production. So hopefully this video will inspire some of you to get out there and support these guys because they're doing magnificent work. And this is a really great project. Uh, so check it out and pledge. I'll, of course, put the links in the show notes for you. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover. So without further ado, here it's Alan and Luke. Yeah, no, I just want to say that it's uh, it's really nice to meet you uh, after all these years of watching a few of your shows. And uh, it's really cool to be here on Matt Chat. Yeah. Yeah, like so I, th I think Matt covered my my Neverwinter Nights module Siege of Shadowdale, enhanced edition. Maybe last year, could be the year before. I remember you're a big fan of the rats in the center quest. <laughs> that was a year ago. Yeah, we were gonna. Was, I was gonna connect with you. About yeah, it. I don't think we ended up doing it, but we're here now. <laughs> oh, we're here now. That's what's important. Yeah, it's talking. Yeah, I want to thank Matt, uh, Bradley, Shergy, and Trent as well for helping us connect. And he's like, yeah. Hey, Lockdown. Yeah, thanks, Trent. He's got nice hair and he knows things. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know, Alan? Well, let me show you guys. Uh, the, let me show your your Kickstarter because that's probably what we're gonna at least start with. I would assume, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The dragons demand. I, I was showing this. I showed the video to my. I got a game studies class this semester, and I, I showed them this video, and they're just like. <laughs> can i buy this i'm like no 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 it's it's like we got to kick it and then you know yeah yeah that seems to be a lot of people's they back us. Yeah, so how do you uh, generally talk about this you probably have a, a nice pitch for this in you terms of you know, what this game's all about yeah, yeah i mean that's what makes it different than uh yeah, i've been playing the pathfinder wrath of the righteous i got into that again so great game uh, this no. will probably be out about the time I'm done with that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure it'll be a difference. So. Quite a few big differences between those those games, though. Yeah, no, I mean, this game is your classic kind of CRPG, you know, with the depth of role playing, really intriguing story, fun companions to join you. It's a party based single player game. Uh, and what makes it really special is our. 3D cubic grid system for verticality, something that you've never seen in a game, as far as we know, before, to do all kinds of things that the Pathfinder rule set has. And on top of that, we're going back to our roots with RPGs when we played tabletop with using miniatures as our characters. And those are a couple of things that really stand out for this game because it's a crowded field with the CRPGs out there. Mm. So this should make it special. Yeah, I've got to show a piece of the video here. You mind if I show a little bit of the trailer? No, for sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because you show the uh, the miniatures here. I think it's right around this point. No. <laughs> there you are. Where's the... There we go. Oh. Yeah, so this is what most of us grew up with, right? Yeah. The tabletop scene. And that's exactly what I say in the video there. This game is really inspired by my early days in tabletop in the late 80s. I was playing D&D. &D, and I had so much fun. Like it, it, rolling around the floor laughing practically, you know, eating chips, drinking pop and that kind of stuff. And we just I just wanted to recreate that feeling uh, in, in a video game. I'm, I'm sure a lot of other RPG developers do as well. But for me, this was a big of inspiration, especially with the game using miniatures and throwing dice in the game. If you want, it's an optional thing. 
I wouldn't even have that as an option. I mean, I wouldn't even make that optional. I think that's a cool thing. <laughs> Everybody should see. Now, I was thinking about this. Uh, I think we're pretty much on the same table, I guess, as it were, with this, with the thinking behind this. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's so much about this tabletop experience that I feel is still kind of unique to the tabletop. You know, computer role playing games are certainly lots of great ones, but I still feel like there's room there to try to bring these things together more, be a little bit more faithful to that tabletop experience. Yeah. I remember talking to, uh, I think it was Brian Fargo. Yeah. One of his games, and he had the, he was a game where you could see the dice being rolled. <laughs> and we were talking about this, and I'm like, that's perfect. You know, because yeah. why hide that that kind of stuff behind, uh, you know, why not show that, try to bring it more to the uh, forefront? Yeah, because you see other RPGs out there where there's like a dice on screen that sort of spins around in the center, but it's not actually rolling in the world. And we right. thought, well, why not actually show what the dice originally were? And so, yeah, it's it's... It's really what we're presenting here is like an enhanced tabletop. It's like what you see, you see I've seen these beautiful dioramas for tabletop. You probably have two with using Dwarven Forge. And, and is there a way to bring that alive? Like you can't, you know, flying characters, people stack them with coins or other things, right? And and so wouldn't it be great? Yeah, you're going to, wouldn't it be great if you could actually see them fly and swim? So that's what we mean by enhanced tabletop. Yeah, exactly that. <laughs> and so this is what he came up with as a way to. I don't know if you could see this. It's got like. Oh yeah, now we can see it. What's that called again, Matt? Oh god, what is it called? Elevation indicator, I think. Yeah. But and, I mean, he's, he sells. Uh, I don't know how many thousands of these things he's sold. But, but that just goes to show that people really want yeah. to see their creatures flying. It's not a matter of oh my creature's flying. It's on the table. No, it's got to be up in the air. And <laughs> and that's what we want to show in the game. It's like, yeah, your mini can fly in the air or swim or dive and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's bringing it alive in a different way than other <laughs> CRPGs bring their worlds alive. Yeah. Yeah, Luke, sounded like you wanted to jump in there. No, I was going to say, we have, we have many different movement mechanics. We have flying, we have crawling, we have climbing, you have, we have levitating. Um, if, the, if the human body can move... In a certain way, we probably got it covered. Ex except for digging, we are not doing. Okay, digging. we're not doing. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is great. I always thought it'd be neat to have a game that really brought the miniatures to life. You know. Yeah. But just, I've just actually had a thought here, Adam. Should we implement a hardcore mode where the dice can actually knock over the miniatures? <laughs> like, there's a, there's a percentage chance of the, the game board being interrupted. That's a good <laughs> be fun. You know, in my game, back when we used to play on the tabletop, we think my group of all has uh, moved to fantasy grounds. But I, 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 I'm kind of missing that tabletop miniatures game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyway, I was thinking sometimes you roll uh, for a, a stealth check or a trickery, or what you, like picking a lock or something, a yeah. dexterity roll. <laughs> I always thought if I was the DM, uh, if you roll for that and your dice roll off the table, that's critical fail. <laughs> <laughs> you're really a hard games master yeah and, and i don't think we're going to have an edge of a table here to fall uh, off no, of, no. but you know no. right. yeah so yeah the, the dice was really uh, an interesting aspect it took us a while to to get it down and then we started just exploring all the kinds of cool things you can do with dice right like we show in the video fire dice rainbow dice but we all have a lot of other dice that will that will develop with cool effects and it's stuff dice. you can't see in physical tabletop. Like that's what you usually see: plastic dice, or metal right. dice, or stone dice, mm -hmm. but but no effects. Cool. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm even thinking of having something from the main menu where you can go to a dice box or something like that, where you can actually just have fun tossing your dice to to see what they're like, and maybe even using them in your tabletop. I don't know. It's it's a fun thing. We're getting feedback from backers saying. Wouldn't it be cool if you could vary the dice set that gets thrown depending on your action? So you use your fire sword and it automatically throws yeah, your fire dice. Right, neat idea. I thought I that, that was really cool. And I, we made a yeah. note of that to to do. Yeah, that's you definitely should go with that. Have you thought about making these people are gonna hate me for even suggesting this? <laughs> Have you thought about making some dice uh what do you call it, micro transactions or what's that word for when you like you can stuff like that. Action. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, look, well, look. The, bonus the, dice, bet. not the main, but, you know, if you want, like, extra fancy stuff, you know. Well, well, that that's what we actually have. We have sort of the basic dice, you know, the plastic dice. We probably have some metal dice as well. 
but the additional dice with effects are actually DLC that you get to buy. So you don't need them for the game. It's just if you want your dice looking cool, flashy, then you can get those additional DLC. And we're open to fan suggestions, or maybe we'll run a poll for additional dice people may want, and we can make another DLC based on that. Oh, man. Um, in sure fact, our, sure. our our top tier, our Dragon Edition, that someone actually bought, which we're really happy at, they get to design their own dice. So, and we'll make it for them, just for them. Oh, did I get that? What did I get? I don't think I got the top one. And I got to check this because I want to get the dice. <laughs> oh, I see. So you got like elemental. I'll show this so people can see what I'm talking about. All right. So when you buy the, uh, or when you pledge, you can opt for, there we go. Gym dice, elemental dice fantastical dice the, the fantastical dice is just something that's out there like the rainbow dice or we'll have a, a dark tapestry dice with some kind of mm, ancient horror you know like cthulhu-esque stuck inside staring at you right oh, it's, it's oh, that kind of neat stuff that's badass <laughs> oh man we could, we could even we could even have like a critical failure thing where cthulhu emerges from the dice ah yes <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> That would be pretty awesome. Of, yeah, the right, tentacles yeah. would reach out and, uh, yeah, cause some damage, area yeah. effect damage. <laughs> we should we should definitely, but anything's possible in a video game. As my programmer likes to say, my lead programmer, Kevin Smith, anything's possible in a video game. It just depends how long you want to spend doing it. But the cool stuff, I, cool stuff with the dice, I definitely like to do because people will like that. Well, it's the essence of all this. I mean, that's where it all started from. I mean, I've talked to some of these, some of the original uh, D&D creators you know and they they'll always start by talking about the dice yeah the special dice and there's a guy here i've, I've interviewed before that talks about like the the physics or not physics but the geometry i guess whatever the word is for designing those dice and why you can't there's certain numbers of sides you can't make a dice for <laughs> yeah they, they have to be weighted correctly to to Amazing. roll evenly so you got to pay attention there's so much science just in like a d20 and making you know, figuring out the right shape for that and everything. It's, yeah. it's pretty cool. But every every person I know who plays Dungeons and Dragons, I don't know about Pathfinder, maybe double for them, but nobody has one set of dice. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're coming to your uh, you're coming to game, you've got like your yeah. crown royal sack with like three thousand and five hundred dice sets. Yeah, I, so I've I think, seen those. I think during my misbegotten teenage years, I had a wardrobe filled with maybe five hundred to a thousand, just a gigantic container overflowing with dice. I don't know where they all went, but um, I miss them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's great to, to focus on that as as well. Maybe you could talk a little bit more. I'm trying to wrap my head around what you're saying with the 3D. Okay. So we, we're used to the flat maps, uh, the square grids, you know, that's the hexagons everybody's familiar with that but you're talking about a a cube grid yeah, that's right and yeah, maybe i could so I so yes that better i feel like <laughs> so so typically with with you know tabletop rpgs you have your 2d grid you like your flip map on the table and they move between grid squares but we wanted to be able to do movements that are three-dimensional that is not just climbing like walking on a surface or climbing up a wall we want to we're doing that but actually moving through 3D space with levitation or flying or, or diving. So you're actually moving through empty spaces. And to do that, you have to move from grid squares that are 2D to actually grid cubes. So you'll see some shots in the game of flying creatures in the air. So it's, 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 a, different, it's a different thing that is going to add, literally, another dimension to encounters. Right making a 2d battlefield a 3d battlefield and so having to think in a different dimension to take into account possibility of an airborne enemy flying down on you and attacking you breathing with fire on you maybe you respond by casting an levitation spell to to obtain the same elevation and then attacking it so it's a whole new element in tactical combat that we're introducing we're very excited about yeah i can imagine different speeds for flight like it'd probably be slower to fly up but if you're coming down on something, you probably get a extra movement. Well, I'm not. I'm not. Maybe it depends on wind, and we mentioned that in the description. Flying would be impacted by wind. If there's a big easterly yeah. wind, you won't move as fast. You know, if 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 the wind's going from east to west, you won't move as fast going to the east. But you'll probably move faster going west. It's the same with say walking on the ground. If 
we decide it's going to rain and it's muddy, it'll slow down your movement speed. So yes. even water currents is the same kind of thing. You got to get that freedom of movement spell going then. Yeah. Will that apply to air combat, air speed? Air, air combat, water combat. It's it's trying to be faithful to what you see in the rules with things that impact uh, the world. We have to we have to really test it to make sure it ends up being fun. This is what we want to do. And, you know, Paizo has given us the leeway to adjust to make sure the fun factor stays there. You don't want to implement something and it's no fun yeah. to play. So we're going to adjust it. So we say these things, but it may not be a literal translation. Like it's going to be yeah. the essence of it and we'll tweak it for a video game to make I, sure it's I fun to play. I think it's important to note that though we're doing a very faithful adaptation of Pathfinder 2E rules, um, we're also making a CRPG for the, the broader audience. And so we want the game to be fun. If you've been played and enjoyed Baldur's Gate or Neverwinter Nights or the Divinity original sin series, you're going to want to play Pathfinder Dragon's Demand. And so we're, yeah, we're, we're, we have to, we have to weigh being faithful to the rules with, is this, is this fun? Do we want to do this exactly this way? Does it translate properly to a video game? And if the answer is yes, and that's great. If if there, if it doesn't translate quite perfectly, then we we may need to just tweak things around the edges a little. But the, the the most important thing to focus on is that it's fun. It's a fun game to play. The player has to be having the fun, right? Immersing themselves in the world, enjoying the story, enjoying the combat, and just having a great time. We we also have to make sure that in doing three D uh, with movement and so on, that it the control makes it easy. We don't want to have a very confusing controls of moving 3D because that could put off people. It has to be a very simple way to actually it has to be intuitive. Characters yes, we don't, want to be, we don't want to confuse the player. Um, it's great to add a new element like 3D combat and movement, but it has to feel intuitive mm -hmm. and it can't act as a barrier to the player enjoying the game, being able to control the game. So and we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Yeah. I have confidence. A lot of that would have to do with, I guess, camera controls. Yeah, yeah. Being able to see what's going on. Yeah, it's it's in terms of a PC input, you know, with your mouse, what to do in terms of movement and clicks, and how the camera moves along with that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now we've you touched on the rules a little bit there. Now I was uh, doing a little research on this. You know, again, coming to this from probably directly from Pathfinder Wrath, and I think that uses the first edition. Yeah, it was. Yes, yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering. I know there's a lot of differences between the first and and the second uh, rule sets. I wonder, like, which of those? What, what do you think are the biggest changes that are really going to uh, have a, the most impact on the gameplay? Is there anything that I'm going to be like, oh man, I hate that? <laughs> or is it is good changes that'll make it? address some of the I think, one, I think one of the main things will be that the the way the the team or the party is balanced and the way it complements each other is very important i think in pathfinder first edition it was it was possible to create some very powerful broken builds that almost made the party members feel unimportant uh, that's not the case in in second edition so in the dragon's demand you should be able to create a party that focuses on flavor and you know, being being the kind of character you want to role play that still is effective in a combat situation. But if you did that, and actually I made the mistake when I first played Pathfinder Kingmaker of including a few characters that weren't mechanically very good, and it was such a hard game in the early months of release. <laughs> um, yeah, and and so maybe the difficulty there was was definitely on on the hard side. We want our game to be challenging, but we want it to be fair, and we want it to allow players to create kind of party. And create the kind of characters that they want to role play as. If they have like a quirky, like a quirky character build in mind, like a concept, let them play it, and and hopefully the the combat will will still remain balanced and enjoyable. And also from a, a combat design point of view, I can briefly touch on this because this is one of the things that I've been considering about the the uh, Pathfinder Kingmaker and Wrath of the Righteous. I felt like the combat design in those games, as I say, it was very much designed around a power build type of party, so a party that's fully optimized. And also, I mean, they were brilliant games. I felt like a lot of the emphasis on the combat was in pre-buffing, so you had to cast the correct spells and you had to be fully prepared. I'd prefer in our game to focus more on like the round by round, what, what, what tactics can I change as the player to turn a difficult combat scenario into one that I can win? And so for me, it's less, it's a binary, 
I'm either going to win or I'm not, depending on the pre and the party composition. And it's more, this is a fluid combat situation where I could win or I could lose, but it will depend on my choices on a round-by-round -round basis. Mm -hmm. And for me, that that's, that's more of a system that I've grown to become fonder of as I've gotten a bit older, I think, and I maybe have less time to to constantly redo fights <laughs> or, or Google, how, how can I min-max my party? <laughs> I think so. I know exactly. <laughs> I could not agree more, <laughs> you know, with that. I, you know, I was reading about the these rule changes and I'm trying to figure mm -hmm. this out because I thought I had it figured out. But so the old system, you've got these swift actions, you've got mm -hmm. a move action, you've got the bulk, you got your combat action or whatever they call that standard action, yeah. I guess. Now, I, I understand that this has all changed for the new... Uh... So, so second edition operates on a three action economy. So everything gets three actions per round. Um, and it's it's a very different it's a very different style of of game. I think it incorporates some elements of D and D fourth and fifth edition, but it's very much its own thing. Um, and um, yeah, we're we're super excited about about being the first official Pathfinder second edition game, and bringing these rules to a video game with our writing pedigree and our game design background and the stuff we've made previously demonstrated we can make a, an awesome adventure full of exploration and fun and i think i think adam and i have very much have the same vision for this which is recreate that tabletop feeling of adventure and excitement awesome fun combat and tell a great story definitely definitely one of the things i always liked about the pathfinder system is the crunchiness <laughs> yes you know, I love, uh, I mean, in some ways I hate it because you got to do a lot of reading, I guess. But I remember like when I'm trying to create characters, <laughs> you get like, what have they got, 50 classes, you know? Mm -hmm. you're, you're going through all these. And one of the things, what you're talking about, Luke, earlier, you can get sort of messed up with your characters, mm -hmm. especially if you're new, yeah. you're just trying to learn how this system works. I mean, you don't necessarily know, you're not thinking six levels ahead. Well, I need to get this feat now so I can get this feat later that'll complement this and yeah yeah you get mixed up so quickly with that but it sounds like they've addressed some of these i think so yeah i think so i think that i think the second edition is designed more it lets you build the character in the way you want while still remaining useful and again a large, large part of the emphasis is on how, how your team can complement each other so we have gonna have 12 companions fully developed with their own histories their own counter arcs, their own side quests, some of them may be romanceable. And so the player will be able to choose any of these 12 to build their party. Um, so there's going to be lots of customization options available for them to find the absolutely ideal group. Romance options. <laughs> yes. I yeah, know that's important. We'll see, we'll see how that looks in a game with miniatures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if you think back to the BG1 and BG2, they're tiny sprites on the screen. Like you're not yes. seeing Baldur's Gate 3 level intimacy, and yet people still loved romances in BG2. Like, so I think it's a stretch for people's imagination to, to imagine what's going on when they see the text and hear the VO. And I think it'll I think depend it, on the writing and the VO, right? That's going to be key. Yeah. They have to feel yeah. convinced from, from that aspect, and, and I will do that. We'll do that. I don't think you actually have to see things happening on the screen. Well, it might be fun to try. <laughs> yeah, I like that where you're going with that idea. <laughs> don't think about it in too much detail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of the table when I play tabletop, a lot of times the DM will say, We're just gonna theater of mind this. Okay, talk to that. So it sounds like this game is there's, there's a certain element of that, right? We're Instead of these, instead of having to show you everything in some kind of animation, we're just going to leave a lot of this to your own mental hardware. <laughs> to, to some extent, we we initially had the idea of just having miniatures being completely static, mm -hmm. one single pose, just like in real physical tabletop. But that wasn't realized that wasn't going to work with all the actions we have to do. If they climb a wall, they can't stay in their standing pose. That looks silly. So we do actually change the poses for yep. creatures based on their actions. So if they're climbing a tree or a wall, it's different than climbing a rope. It's different than flying or diving. Uh, 
or, or grabbing hold of a ledge if someone tried to push them off. Mm -hmm. So they are static, but they have multiple static poses. What they don't have are animations where they, you know, move their arms and limbs and so on. But but uh, they're they're more than just one pose. I'm really looking forward to seeing what what you come up with for this. You know, I played around a little bit with the uh, Unity and some of those <clears throat> characters, and I mean, most of the time you're just looking at something called an idle animation, <laughs> <laughs> which really just loops over and over again. So I really wonder if it's going to be, you know, if it's going to really require that much imagination. My my guess is once people start playing this within a few minutes, you know, they're going to be totally into it. I mean, I hope so. So I hope that I hope that they 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 begin playing and they're immediately immersed in the world yeah. and the setting of the story and 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 they quickly become accustomed to the graphic style and and what they're taking away from it is the same kind of great role playing adventure and reactive world that they've played in previous AAA RPG titles yeah. it's a whole new approach and we're excited by it yeah, it's just yeah there, there's a huge benefit of not having to do thousands yeah. of animations for all kinds of characters races and so on you know we want to have all or many of most of the weapons that you have in Pathfinder. There's a whole bunch of, of types, right? <laughs> and but we can do that since we just create a pose, a combat yeah. pose or, or an idle pose holding the weapon. And you know, and we don't have too, to right? actually have show armor it that will, will change on, on the miniatures depending on which armor the character has equipped, it will update yeah. on, on the model. So it yeah, does but, automatically yeah. when you get a new weapon or new armor. You yeah. see it on your miniature. Yeah, that's that's something we we thought about at the beginning too. Just like static poses, it was well, can they change armor? And eventually, we thought, well, you know, minis don't. But this is a video game. Ideally, in a video game, people do want to see their fancy new armor yes. that they just bought or or looted from a boss. We're going to do that. So all the armors swap, uh, the weapons swap. You'll be showing you know whatever you just found or bought on your, on your miniature. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about all those crazy weapons they got, like a Bardiche, a Falchion. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I got we'll, have, we'll so, have them. We will. Yeah, I, I don't know. I know people with the miniatures, and they will go out and get the what is the Heroes Forge where they go to get the custom miniatures made. Is that right? Heroes Forge, something like that. Yeah, Hero Forge. They can make their. There's like a website miniatures. they go to to design their miniatures, and every yeah. time they get new weapons or new armor, <laughs> they get the new set of miniatures. <laughs> Like wow, this is gonna, yeah. and 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 that's what you do in physical tabletop. I believe it's called kit bashing. You you get different pieces. You you want to be holding the falcon instead of the rapier, falcon. right? And you have to get a different weapon or a different arm. With us, it's going to be automatic when you swap them in the game. So it sounds great. I got some questions. Uh, well, there's one question here from Punny, who watches the, you know, big fan of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, will there be an editor so users can make their own adventures? not in not in this game we're focusing just on the single player experience the editor like a tool set like neverwinter nights kind of thing and multiplayer are the two biggest features that we've seen backers ask about and we already knew this before we launched yeah. the campaign and the intent is that if this game is funded and if if it does you know gets out there and well enough to release that and paizo wants to continue making pathfinder games with us we would look at doing a second game with multiplayer that's at the top of the list and if we go beyond that we would look at maybe doing a third game with a tool set we'll have to see this is not stuff i've really discussed with paizo but given what people have been asking about on kickstarter these are our thoughts and a lot of our team's background our core members come from the neverwinter yes. community so they were yeah. like luke right they were well versed with making a tool set so if there's a developer out there an rpg developer that takes on making a tool set we have the right people to know well what makes a good tool set versus not kind of thing I'd also up there because we come from a modding background or many of the team have come from a modding background we understand how a good tool set should be designed to enable a model to build something so we wouldn't want to try to create a set of tools or to facilitate modding and not do it properly so if we're going to do it at some point we want to do it so that it's user friendly, and it could potentially kickstart the same kind of explosion in homemade adventures that Neverwinter Nights did back in the day, right? But it has to be done properly when we get around to tackling it. And yeah, and to do it properly requires 
lots of dev time and people. And I was yes. at Bioware when they did Neverwinter. And that the, I saw the tools department. There was like eight people all working on the tool set. Now, I, I switched over to Neverwinter during its last year in development, but it had that game had been developed for five years. I'm sure Trent told you about that. And I'm sure, and it was a tool set game to begin with. So you're looking at a tool set department working four to five years to make that Neverwinter tool set. That's a lot of time investment. So a, people have to a, remember that. Amount of time. It's crazy. People have to rem remember that when they're asking, "Hey, can you make a tool set?" Well, look at Neverwinter Nights and how much that took. We're going to need to get the groundwork for a game yeah. before even doing that kind of stuff. As much I as we like often, to do. What it. often tends to happen is that CIPG developers would include some modding tools or capability as a, you know to 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 try to appease the fans that want this functionality. But because it's rarely developed or user friendly enough to be truly accessible, you don't end up getting much in the way of adventure content. You may get some like new graphics, or you may get some cool UI additions or features. But creating new adventures content, it's, it seems to be pretty rare among those RPGs that have had tool sets of a kind over the last 10 years. So when we get around to doing it, we want to do it properly and we want to enable. You know, we want to enable modders to create their own adventure content and share it and, and as easily as possible. And to clarify, like people have asked for modding. So there's two kinds of modding. There's the kind of yes. create yeah. your whole new adventures. And then there's a the kind of modding that you want to go in and you want to tweak things. I want to tweak things in the rules or stuff like that. We are now looking at adding some kind of light modding support for tweaking stuff after we ship the game. Uh, in response to people asking for that, which is different than a tool set, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. The, the, uh, well, I think some people think a tool set is somehow easy. <laughs> <laughs> we just tacked well, that on. As Alan said, it's, it's four to five years of work with a team of eight people. <laughs> but I mean, it's when you look easy. at the, the, the intensive that you've created over the years, and of course, Luke's uh, you know, Siege of Shadowdale. You know, if anybody I, knows the what you need to make a really good editor it's you yeah i'm i'm sure there're probably some other people out there but i'm sure it's really just a small handful of people that that could probably pull it off and you really have to not just know oh, about what you think but actually having made modules like tool set content to to have the experience to know yeah, but your modules are among the best ever for that <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, for, uh, for Neverwinter Nights, you mean? Nights and Nights too. Are you speaking about Alan's or mine or both? Both. <laughs> so, some of them we, we, we've developed together. <laughs> I know. But mine, mine was slightly better. I'm, I'm, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, you would be people that, when you're working on that, you're thinking about, you know, what am I trying to say? Like, you got experience with that tool set. From yes, people. you would know. We have a lot of end user experience, right? So that gives us the ability to to see it from the end user's point of view when we come to develop it. I think that's really important. Yeah. Excuse me. Even even myself, like I I led Darkness Over Daggerford, our first game, and Neverwinter Nights module, uh, and you know, I I was actually in there making levels. Like I made maybe eighty percent of the areas in Neverwinter Nights. So. We all have different things that we bring to the table and on our team, like Luke with writing and design, but he also did scripting. Kevin, our lead yep. programmer, had was also doing a premium mod for Bioware at the time before they got canceled, and he was really big into scripting it. My side was level design. So we all have different aspects of uh, you know, module building uh, in a tool set for games. I was reading a little bit about Darkness, darkness Over Daggerford. And is this true that they went through five different designers? Because <laughs> that's what uh, Wikipedia was claiming. You know, we we went through a bunch. It's it's been such a long time now, almost twenty years. Yeah, I wonder. It, it's that. hard for me to remember. Um, but we did go through a, a few. It, I think I I remember probably about two, and it, it didn't work out. Eventually, I was sort of the lead designer on it, and I would get someone to sort of work with me on that. A lot of the the breakdown of the world was me. The making of the areas, like eighty percent of them, was was me uh, writing quests. Probably fifty percent of them was me writing them. So I took on the role. What I couldn't do, I was not a writer, 
right? And I, I was, thank God after we shipped Daggerford, I found Luke to to fill in that. You know, that you know, guys. I only, I only ever had one designer on my modules, and um, sometimes I did feel like firing myself. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I stuck in there and I got them done. <laughs> But yeah, Darkness Over Daggerford was, it was our first game. It was the first time I had actually worked with community members to do stuff. So it was, it was a difficult process. It was also when Ossian, uh, Ossian was, a, is, is a virtual company and it was at that time. And I was working with people remotely and I was used to working at Bioware on a team in an office where we meet. So I was getting to learn the ropes of working remotely, something which is done now. Yeah, so this back was, in 2004, this is, this is not so in, much. Yeah, this is before it was a commonplace, right? So you were a pioneer. Also, he was yeah. one of the first to, to, to have done this. Yeah. And and so uh, there were a num multiple factors that made that development a bit more difficult uh, than, than it would have been later. But we did manage to pull it off. And even though Atari canceled uh, giving approvals for all the premium modules, which is what Good shut down the program, yeah. You know, we we still spent the the next three months to finish what we had to get it out there and release it for free, and and I'm kind of glad that it was canceled as a premium mod in hindsight because it then allowed us to work with Beam Dog in 2018 with the Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition to actually go back, fix a bunch of bugs, do VO, add more enhancements to it to actually make it a module that we could sell. Which was and of course we, great. we then went on and, and completed my cancelled premium module, which was Tyrants of the Moon Sea. Yeah. And um, so working with, with the Austin team, we we're able to complete and release that. So it I think it worked out well for us. It it took 12 to 15 years <laughs> for the cancellation to, to, to come to fruition, but it, it did end up working out well for us in the end. Yeah, and financially too. The, the we made yeah. a, a, a an a good deal of money from the sale of those modules more than we ever anticipated. And that's what helps fund uh, Pathfinder Dr the Dragon's demand up until this point, at least. Yeah, thank God for Trent. What a, what a, we should just all be thankful. I, yeah, you know, I am very thankful. Clap Trent, oh, Trent, yes. Trent, Trent was persistent. Trent. Trent was very persistent yeah. in, in saying, no, you should really do Darkness Over Daggerford for Enhanced Edition. I'm like, come on, we released it in 2006. It was free. <laughs> You know, it's been out there, downloaded. And he's like, no, you know, just try to, you know, fix it up and release it in a more polished way. And we did. And it did so well. So thank you, Trent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just for people that might not know this part of the story. So we've talked about the premium modules. Like, what was all that about? It was they're, they're trying to get people to make modules and then you had a contract with them to, to do this. Or yeah. Like, so. And, and Luke, I'll get Luke to give his opinion on this, too, because he was also contracted to do it. We. You know, the tool set was out there for people to make their own modules, but there were some people who were really good at making modules. And so they would either be approached by Bioware or maybe they contacted Bioware to say, hey, can we make a module for you? And, and Bioware had created a, a program called the Premium Mod Program where they made modules internally at Bioware just to keep producing content for the I think they were set. testing the waters for DLC, right? This is in the early days when, when DLC was going to be a huge thing. And so I think maybe Neverwinter Nights was their first foray into how this would work. How much money can we make from this? Yeah, this this was simultaneous with, uh, I think, with um, Oblivion's, you know, horse armor kind of oh, DLC. The, oh, the, the, the renowned horse armor. Is it $10 <laughs> for some horse armor or something? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and so, yeah. so I think Bioware was experimenting, but they wanted to, it's a great way not only to give new content for, for people to play, but along yeah. with each module, they would produce new art and new VO, which was then new content for modders to use in their games. So it was a way to, to you know, give new adventures and content. So they were doing that internally, but they were also fielding uh, um, you know, requests from, from modders themselves. So that's how I had talked with uh, at Greg Zeschuk at uh, um, GDC. I think this was 2000 and four yeah it must have been 2004 about doing a module and he's like yeah that sounds great and that's how we got involved with making and that's when i had to sort of try to find modders and build up a team there was that whole process and and i'm not sure how did how did you get involved luke with the premium mod program um, so i believe after the success of my second module i believe i wrote to rob bartell who was the then um live team lead designer i think he was actually the guy who design the, the narrative for the original OC campaign. But he was he played my second module, Crimson Ties of Tafir, was very impressed. 
and offered me a contract for the third one. So Alan and I were simultaneous, simultaneously developing our respective premium mods. I was developing Tyrants of the Moon Sea. Alan was developing Darkness of Daggerford. I believe DLA were developing Women's Kind of Cornea, which yeah. also got a, which actually was the only one of the three that got a commercial release through Atari because it was so close to the finishing line. But but probably looking back, it was actually Darkness Over Daggerford that because it was released for free for free at the time and received something like 40,000 downloads in a day or a week or something. I think that was probably the module that left a larger mark. Yeah, I, I don't remember what it was, but it was the biggest yeah. Neverwinter Vault had ever seen for, for but, a month. But at the time, at the time I was like a fresh faced 24 year old and i was counting on that money to to pay for my upcoming wedding and then atari pulled the plug and i'm like oh what the hell is what am i gonna do why did atari do that but then but then like like a knight in shining armor alan rode along on his white stallion and said would you like to come with ossian and i was swept away (laughs) (laughs) and that and that was basically the birth of the getting into mysteries of westgate for neverwinter nights too but To, to answer your question, Matt, of why did Atari do that? Why did Atari oh, stop I... giving approvals for premium modules, which have been forced Bioware to cancel the whole you're thing? Give the, been you're going to give well. the, the politically correct answer here, or the true answer. <laughs> but there, there is, only, to me, there's only one. It's the true answer. Is is Neverwinter Nights two was coming out in a few months in the fall of two thousand and six, okay. and they didn't want anything getting in the way of the visibility for Neverwinter Nights two. So they're like, well, they don't. We don't want Neverwinter Nights one products releasing at the same time. So you're all canned, basically, and that that's the reason. And and Bioware said, sorry guys, and and that was it. The irony, though, Matt, is is that a few couple of months later, Atari came to us and said, hey, will you make a premium mod for Neverwinter Nights two? So and that's that's how we so went that's into whole, doing that's a whole other story. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an even more tragic story. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The tragic story with Mysteries of Wesker is that the great side of it is we got in there, we started using the tools, which wasn't actually finished by Obsidian, and, and got it working. And we made it in the seven, eight months that we had planned on budget. We did a really great game. And this was before either of the expansion packs for Neverwinter Nights 2 had come out. And so this was going to be some great, it was called an adventure pack. This is bigger than a module, probably a bit less than an expansion pack for people to play. Yeah, it's pretty big. Yeah, and then it got stuck in limbo because Atari decided we want a DRM on this. And then in addition to that, there were disagreements or discussions, let's call it, between Atari and Obsidian on just contractual things in terms of their support. And we got stuck in limbo for 19 months. It was so painful to watch that. And eventually we were released after both expansion packs. It was like trying to serve an appetizer instead of at the beginning of the meal, just before yes. your dessert. I'm like, this this doesn't make sense. And it was a good game, but it really didn't get the attention that I think it deserved at that point. Yeah, I think the problem, it was supposed to be the first piece of additional content, ended up being the third. And so you had two Obsidian developed expansions, one of which, Masker's Betrayer, is widely regarded as a modern, well, so I suppose it's not modern nowadays, but you know, one of the, the best CRPGs of the last 20 years. So we made a great game, it was just a great game release, probably 20 months too late. Yeah, just talking to George about I was wondering if he knew if he knew you. Because <laughs> he had done some uh, uh he did mask and I think he did some other things, but so George like, really George, want, George lights. Lights? Yeah, so he wants yeah. to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> I just figured we you know it's a small well. I figure it's a small world, you probably would have, you know. I, I never crossed paths with George. I, I knew about him, but uh there's Zeitz and George Zoller. I think there's two Georges, isn't there? Yeah, you think of Zeitz. I think he was a guy who led the narrative design on Mask of the Betrayer. I think that's right. Yeah, Mask of the Betrayer. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we didn't cross paths. Yeah, it is a bit of a small community, but we don't necessarily get to Not talk to each other. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be fun to do a chat sometime. Actually, I'm on there uh, too, just so you could... You know, I always just like to just kick back and listen to geniuses talk to each other <laughs> yeah you, you should get a, a group mat chat going with all yeah. these rpg people i'm not sure if you've done that but i mean me trance and you know people from, from i don't know obsidian or who knows what larian around, 
a round table. There you go. A Matt Chat round table, just like they have at GDC. Yeah, we could have miniatures. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see. We, uh, we got a little bit. Of, you got a little bit more time here. I don't know. So sure. have a few more questions. Uh, so one thing was, uh, well, I got a couple kind of small things we could probably knock these out quick. Uh, somebody had asked about voice acting. You know, your thoughts. I mean, that's always something that comes up. I do with the interviews with indies, especially because they've got a limited budget and they they worry about locking in the script. <laughs> you know, once they do the voice acting and and all that stuff. So, do you have thoughts? Yeah, just yeah. general philosophy. Uh, of bottom line, there is going to be voice acting. There has to be voice acting. We want voice acting to in order to bring characters alive as little miniatures. You need voice acting, and it's just like the original Baldur's Gate games. They're little sprites, but their voices, like you know, like Minsk and so on. They, they bring the characters to life. So we are having voice acting. What what level of voice acting is going to vary a bit with the funding amount that we're going to get for our Kickstarter. So mm -hmm. you have some games that do full VO for everything, and, and that's going to be more expensive. And you have other games, I believe, like Kingmaker or Wrath of the Righteous that yeah. full, give full VO to companions and main NPCs. But secondary NPCs, you might get just the intro line is being VO'd, but not the rest. So... That's a consideration of we are going to evaluate based on uh, what we get from the Kickstarter campaign, as well as uh, the voice actor level. On the original Baldur's Gate games, that was recorded in L.A. using SAG actors, and and some of them, you know, were uh, several scale actors. That means much more expensive than the baseline. And so, in an ideal world, that's what we'd like to do. Ideally, it'd be great to have full VO with recorded in L.A. with SAG actors. We're just going to have to see what what we're able to do with the campaign. I suspect, I suspect there will be a mounting of dialogue in the game, right? So we're talking hundreds of thousands of words. So, um, but we'll we'll need to find find the right way to go about um, voicing as much of the the dialogue as we can manage while maintaining the very deep characterization and number of options the player will be able to have in, in you know in social situations, etc. I was just wondering if Jim Cummings is still around. So I guess the, he was not the voice actor for Minsk in the new one. Was he not? No, no. It was, I think uh, it was Matt. Was it Matt Mercer, possibly? Yeah, Matt Mercer. I didn't even know that. Huh. Yeah. I, I didn't was, know that either. I wonder if he, did, he, did, he did a great job of sounding like the original voice actor, by I'll the way. He did yeah, I didn't even question it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But actually, I played Baldur's Gate 3, obviously. The, the Minsk dialogue is. Probably the strong, in my opinion, the strongest in, in Baldur's Gate 3. It's it's really authentic and really great. So kudos to whoever wrote him. Kudos to Matt Mercer for voicing him. Yeah. yeah a lot of students, they know about that game. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how popular that, that was. Are there 20 million copies sold or something? Last I heard. Yeah, I mean, I, was, I figured it would be successful, but I didn't think it would explode like it did. I don't think they're interested in doing another one. <laughs> That's Swin. Okay. Well, but I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure they're going to use the same engine or an expanded version of it to make something that's similar, right? With either their own world, Divinity, or or a different license. So I'm sure you'll see something cool from Lyrian in the future with that. Sure, I mean, I think it was the same thing with their original Sin, too. That was a great one. Uh, what about... Uh, let's see, we kind of talked about that already. Coins. <laughs> Maybe we don't need to talk about the coins. I sent you a coin, by the way. <laughs> oh well, thank you very much. Yeah, we we talked about that, and and I'm I still have to send you the uh, a silver Absalon piece. You know that that came about just because I'm a big coin collector. I was as a kid, and to me, making a currency from a fantasy world like something authentic, it just makes me really excited and we needed i wanted to have a, a reward a physical reward for people that wasn't just being manufactured in china and i wanted something made in north america and something that's small that's easy to ship and coins really fit the bill with that and um so yeah that's why and it's always either coins or the cloth maps yeah y'all love the cloth oh, maps. yeah i sent i sent eric mona a few coins he's in minnesota too and uh yeah yeah, that's that's the silver piece um, with the Primark gear of Gix uh, on one side and the Badger on the other. That's uh, 
Yeah, no, we're using a mint in uh, Rochester, New York, who's, who's been around for several decades, and they even make stuff for the U.S. mint, so they're well respected. So you're going to get an authentic coin, you know, made by a real mint, uh, and you, it can be copper, it can be pure silver. Uh, to make it affordable for people, we have plated versions, so you can get silver plated, gold plated, platinum plated, all these different Absalon pieces. And from the high tiers, like such as the Dragon Edition, they actually get the full solid gold version, solid platinum version of these coins, which is uh, open. Do you have copies for the dev team, Alan? I can't have <laughs> yeah, all mine. Yeah. Sure, why not? <laughs> time you get a solid <laughs> platinum coin, you're probably not getting that much money from them. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're making we're coins are are stamped. It's called striking, right? Mm -hmm. You put a blank in there, and this thing comes down and stamps. And they're not cast or poured metal like people might think. So they're stamped. So once we make the dies, really, it comes down to just getting the blanks for these things, and uh, it, which is expensive. So if you've seen gold prices shot up in the last year uh, since the pandemic, uh, but it's easy once you have the blank just to strike uh, a solid gold version as it is to do a a, a gold plated version so it, it's easy to make it is just pricey but i'm sure there are people out there who want an, a solid gold authentic gold piece so yeah yeah i got me yeah this is one of my favorite ones the, oh the, yeah the the, the, the siege uh, of dragon spear coin yeah yeah i mean this thing is like <laughs> you could wear yep. this as that is hefty. <laughs> it is hefty. I have one too, so it's it's pretty cool. And it it came in the uh, collector's edition uh, for Siege of Dragon Spear for people, uh, which which apparently you can still buy it. I think I'm not sure if there's copies left, but when in, in your in your match chat with Trent, I remember he said that he had a few copies left. Yeah, I love those things. You know, I got a, you know a lot of people have been on the show doing Kickstarters, or maybe they've gone through it already, and they always talk about how trouble. Troublesome it was doing the physical backer rewards. And you know, yeah. to me, I think a coin makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, so, so I've worked I've worked people. with some book uh book people that have that have because of the the, the, the massive increase in po postage during right. the COVID years, it costs them actually more <laughs> to run to run the kits I did just to send the books out eventually than they made from it, just because of the increase in postage posting big books abroad, right? So it's it's very risky if it's anything more than like a coin or cloth. I've even heard people talk about just a box copy. <laughs> it was like they, they they didn't realize how involved that was going to be to get yeah. a box copy and a disc, and they're like, "Oh, we actually lost money." <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 copy that. And I thought, you, oh. don't, you don't be losing money on a Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not when you need to pay for the de development. <laughs> but you guys are, I'm sure, a lot very much experienced when you're thinking about those backer rewards and <laughs> making sure that. You don't lose money on it. Yeah, that's a, we did not want that to happen. And and that's why a small reward makes a lot of sense. Yeah, a coin. It's like the ultimate, the, the reason they've been around for so long, right? They're portable, they're durable. Yeah. <laughs> and, and these have, well, at least the pure ones, intrinsic value. That's what excites me. As a coin collector, I bought, you know, silver, silver coins, uh, Amer U.S. silver dollars, Canadian silver dollars. And so to have a a, a a Pathfinder, an Absalom one, you know, that, that's a basically like a silver dollar or a half silver dollar really in size because it's a half ounce of silver. It's uh, it's really awesome. And it's worth something. That's real silver. So it's it's not just, a, um, you know, it's not just a, a, a it's version. It's not just that, an you know, NFT. Hmm? <laughs> it's not an NFT. <laughs> yes, it's not definitely not that. You guys didn't think about those while you were doing any of this. Yeah, I'm I me personally, I'm I'm not into that stuff. I I I like holding something tangible, even even digital, but something like that. No. I'm not a fan of NFTs. I'm not a fan really of microtransactions. You know, or that. AI. No AI, no microtransactions, <laughs> no NFTs. Yeah, we're we're kind of old school. Old school. <laughs> yeah, those NFTs are something else. Yeah, I could tell you some stories. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Oh, I did get a question about the Shadow Sun. Oh, yeah. A little Ooh. bit different. But, uh, they were saying, wondering about the challenges of that design uh, for the iPad. And I guess it was quite a bit different than making a standard. It, it, 
it was up until that point we'd really been focused on pc gaming so mouse and keyboard but yeah. around 2009 it really started taking off with the iphone and uh we really felt that it was a good opportunity to bring a desktop level rpg you know the depth of rpg to mobile because we weren't seeing that in the stores and and so that's why we made the shadow sun and yeah we had to figure out you know, we're, we're, we're buying iPhones and iPads to figure out the, the yes. input and what makes sense. We went through play. several design iterations, right? So yeah. we, about halfway through, we realized it wasn't necessarily that fun to play. So we went away and we redesigned the combat system. Um, I think we ended up with a really, really good game. It was just maybe a little late to the party by that point. Yeah. it's it's And to clarify, it's an action RPG, but it 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 relies on your character stats as well yeah it has it has role playing options it has it has customizable companions at least you can select their attack modes etc it has all the stuff that you'd get in like a pc triple a rpg of 2010 to 2012 but on a mobile format yeah um, and and i got in the years afterwards like in like the 3 or 4 years after releasing that we got about at least two dozen or three dozen emails from RPG old school RPG gamers who you know were playing since the the Surtec days or the Gold Box games, just thanking us and saying this is my favorite mobile RPG because it had yeah. that depth and and yeah it 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 really was a, a gem of an RPG in my opinion. I think there's a part mobile. of me that would love to remake it with a larger budget for a PC audience. I know you're talking about massive. Um, you know, a massive difference in 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 budget and and expectations. But I just love the world we designed and yeah. the characters. Um, it was really quite unique. So it's not available. You you have to play it on iPad, not on it's or Android. Yeah, the it's the issue Android. the issue now is that it, we have not been able to update it. We've been really focusing on Pathfinder, and we don't have the time or budget to update the Unity version for that, which would take weeks if not months uh and our focus is elsewhere right now so we can't do it which then means that it's only available to play on older devices uh in the store and that's why you don't necessarily see it listed on a new device when you go to try to go to the store to, to check it out so that's the so it's on its way to becoming a forgotten gem yeah yeah but I one day we like luke said we'd like to return to it someday yeah absolutely i would love to i'd absolutely love to i think the world had so much potential but the aesthetic was fantastic yeah. i think you definitely should go for that i mean it's, but, i know you don't like ai but <laughs> I ask, ai make me an updated shadow sun like <laughs> i'm talking to one of those about the game i said tell me about the shadow sun it's like oh this is one of the most this is one of the best uh rpgs ever made for a mobile platform and this was you know, really set the bar high and <laughs> it's really it really likes you <laughs> yeah. i was saying um recently to alan unfortunately it, it was released in the same week as the mobile port of star wars and that's the Zilf republic so as you can imagine that's, that's like a heavy hitting titan entering the arena at the same time as our small indie effort um, nonetheless we were very well reviewed i think we were in a couple of top five uh mobile game of the year lists at the end of the year, so I'm really Red pleased with it. About the setting, people love the setting of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we intentionally chose a different setting. A lot of times, you see settings out there for RPGs. Up, right? They, they yeah. feel like the Sword Coast kind of vibe, and which yeah. is cool. But it's done in so many places. We wanted to give something that had a different flavor, so we chose this ancient, you know, Middle Eastern, this Babylonian kind of flavor yeah. uh, you know, in deserts which we thought, oh, this is a nice change. So, um, yeah, with strange creatures like we had, you know, uh, elephants there, but prehistoric elephants. So we were inventing creatures and, and mixing yeah. time periods. I do in think, there. though, that ironically, the fact we went with that setting maybe led to not as much commercial success as we could have got because it wasn't obvious from the name, The Shadow Sun, or in fact, our initial art, but it was like a, a fantasy role-playing game with swords and magic. So yeah, that was maybe maybe one thing looking back we we, we didn't realize, but I'm proud of it creatively. Yeah, that's one thing I guess you always have to balance is you want to do something original, something unique. Yeah. 
But yeah, you've got, you've got to connect with the audience, right? Yeah, you got to connect Somehow. with the audience. If it looks too yeah. unfamiliar, if they're not familiar with it, maybe they pass it. A pass yeah. by. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Then you talk to them and they're like, oh, we don't, we want something unusual. We want something new, but you can buy it. Want something that, <laughs> that they're familiar with, but not familiar with. So mm -hmm. I think as the artist, you've always got to provide just enough comfort for them to embrace it while making it original enough for them to appreciate that it's bringing something new. And that's the eternal balance of bringing creative stuff to market. Well said. The eternal challenge, I, I should say. <laughs> well, let's uh, can we wrap it up with one final? I, actually, actually I want to say something quick Matt because I don't I don't know if you still you still drink the beer out of the horn at the end oh, of course oh well okay. it's been a while since I've oh okay well that's that's Why what I remember you have a beer so, that you want to try <laughs> for the, for the dragon I'm going to have to drink my beer it's not going to be from a horn it's going to be from a bottle but <laughs> you know well, somebody told me YouTube was like uh, that was the word limiting my videos because of my beer. Oh, oh that. That. yeah, that that, that oh. makes a lot of sense. But I actually designed one of our rewards with you in mind. So in the Dragon Edition, people get to create their own drink for the in the game that you're going to see like everywhere in taverns or in people's houses. You know, be a bottle of so and so drink. So, and, brew. What's that? Barton's brew. Barton's brew. Barton's, there yeah. you go. Barton's brew. You kidding me? Okay, I'll make an exception. <laughs> we're definitely going to be making an exception for that. <laughs> yeah, I always think it just goes so well together, you know? I always think about Baldur's Gate and the, those taverns you'd go in and the dwarf bartender, you know? Yep. My hotel's clean, as clean as an elven arse. <laughs> you do that really that well, man. Right? <laughs> That's one of the most memorable lines from Baldur's Gate. In fact, I think time. I referenced it in Times of the Moon Sea. <laughs> yeah, for, 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 for a joke. Classic. Uh, so you said you had one last question there, Matt. Was that? Yeah, I've got. Uh, uh, well, I was thinking with my game studies, you know, students. There's a lot of them that want to get into the games industry in one way or the other. Hmm. So I thought I would ask you guys. You know, thinking about um, somebody interested, they want to get into some kind of game design, some kind of game development. Maybe they're thinking indie, maybe a big studio, just. What kind, of just kind of, what kind of career advice would you give somebody that's just starting out? I'd say the most important thing is your portfolio. If if you want to get a job anywhere, that's what you're judged on. If you're an artist, you have your art station portfolio. If you're, say, a designer, it's probably your modding portfolio of, of what you've put out. You just have to show your talent, right? And so people can judge it. Without that, and with a poor portfolio, you'll get glossed over by people. You you won't get noticed. So for whatever you do, you know, work hard at it, gain experience at it, and eventually you get to the point that you create some good samples of your work, whether it's art or or design or writing, so that people can can see that. That's that's really important. That's how I judge when we hire candidates. You know, I'm looking at their portfolio uh, and what they can do. So somebody can do with a portfolio with some. Neverwinter Nights modules. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's, that's how I hired past, designers. Right? We've, we've, we've done so. We've done that. We've hired them based on the Neverwinter Nights. Well, that's good to hear. That's what I've been advising people to do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Luke, do you want to add something? But to be honest, I think Alan said much of what I'd have said. I think probably for me, I just got very lucky. So <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'd hear what Adam said. I've always found personally, I did the same with my with my uh, writing career. I was a published author. If you do something that you love, and you put your heart and soul into it, and you keep doing it, and you become good at it, eventually someone somewhere will notice. It won't always happen instantly, but if if you do something great, you create something great. At some point, it will it will it, it will get noticed. So I've, I've always been a big proponent of. Do what you love, and you have to be realistic. If you don't have the talent for something, it's probably better off realizing that before too long has passed. But if you do, know and you know you have the talent for it, keep doing it, keep oh. sharing it, and eventually, someone in the position to influence your career will happen across it, and that's when doors will open. Yeah, and and yeah, so that's and, my advice. And so, adding to what Luke said, yeah, I mentioned a portfolio that's really important, but you have to be very active in trying to yeah. reach people. And I had this in my first job with Relic Entertainment. 
I went to E3 to say hi to them, right? I sent in my 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 portfolio and demos to them trying to get a job. I went I wrote a whole design doc for them, you know, uh, for some imaginary world just to prove to them I could be a designer. So it it's both about showing your talent with your portfolio but doing the best that you can to make sure eyes get on it to see it. You have to you have to be willing to share it and you have to be willing to be able to accept constructive criticism. So mm. I often find art is a balance between believing in yourself enough to create the art, but also being open-minded enough to accept criticism and adjust it and be willing to accept when people with more knowledge than you are providing good feedback. So it's 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 the ego of the artist versus the mm. open-mindedness of the, don't know, the student, the scholar, have to come together. Mm. That one's always open. Yes, yeah, I have to think about there. I just think when I'm talking to students about this, I, I don't tell them this, but, but, you know, when I'm looking, I'll ask them like, what kind of stuff have you made? You know, what kind of, do you have a portfolio? That, that sort of thing. And, and usually they're like, no, I haven't actually done anything. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm not, it doesn't sound too good, but, but every now and then yeah. I'll talk to guy and he's like, yeah, I've got all these notebooks where I've been designing my own role-playing game. And it's like, he's obviously, he's been immersed in this thing. <laughs> yeah. For it's, years and years and i'm like that's looks pretty promising you know you've yeah. got a lot to show people if you're passionate about it you drive yourself right you can't help but do it i was i was i you could say i don't come from a level design background but that's where one of my loves is is level design i, I envision things i'd wanted to be an architect as a kid and back i remember when warcraft 2 came out i was in the editor which was a great little editor making my first level was making uh um i think it was bilbo's journey to to smog and i made this whole map where you could take your party of characters fighting these Alan, it's, it's really funny because i didn't know this so my first ever modding efforts other than trying to program games in basic when i was sort of nine or ten was a warcraft 3 editor and i'd create little levels for my brother to play yeah that's the same yeah. kind of uh journey start by sure. journey so yeah, if you're passionate about it, you're yeah. going to do it naturally. Uh, it's always yeah. good to tell people, but the ones who are passionate will end up making some a good portfolio. Yeah, I think the key too to what you were saying too is that networking idea. Like you got to go meet people. <laughs> you, they're not going to come to you, right? You've got to find them and meet them. And absolutely, them. yeah. All right, so I'm looking at this Dragon Edition. Okay, so <laughs> it's a. Uh, 13,000 Canadian. 13,000. Remember, this is Canadian. So that's like 9,500 American. Oh, it's, only, it's only that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's just a sniff. Or is it? In game personalized drink. Create a famous drink to be stocked by taverns and drunk by townsfolk across the game. Subject to Hussein and Paizo approval. So you were the inspiration for that, Matt. When I did that, I was just thinking of you drinking from your horn <laughs> and thinking what brand of beer would Matt put it wasn't in this me. Game? It wasn't me drinking my bottled beer while we talked via Discord then, Alan, that inspired it. It was Matt. No, it was Matt. <laughs> oh, okay. What is this um. subject to approve of me? What is this? Okay, so well, I... ev everything that, anything creative that gets put in this game is being put in a Pathfinder world people will yeah. end up taking it potentially as canon. So everything, all these things have to be reviewed by Paizo. We have to send it to them. They're going to like, yeah, that sounds okay. Or no, you'll need to change that. You know, putting a mm -hmm. Star Wars character in our game is not allowed, right? So it all has to go through them. But this is what we work with fans with to, to if they have a, an idea and it's like good off the bat, great. If not, we help them shape it to something that, Paisa will like that is fitting for Pathfinder. Yes. Yeah. I have to put some thought into this. Okay. I thought we were going with Barton's Brew. I thought we'd already decided. Well, well <laughs> hey, if that works, <laughs> that'd be a hoot. Yeah, I've ever had a beer that named after me. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much. This has been a blast. Good luck. Yeah. Thanks for Thank the awesome you. chat. It's been great. It's like just about there, right? I was watching well, it pick up during our video here. Well, I mean, it, it can be deceptive because most Kickstarters obtain, they have like a really great opening few days. Uh, we're currently in the, the tough middle part of the Kickstarter. So we 
we need still need all the support we can get. Just um, to... yeah. Just jumped and, up again. Oh, great. What and, and, you know, looking from the backers' reaction and your reaction and other people we've done interviews with, everyone's excited about this. Like, well, yeah. almost everyone. Some some grognards are not. They don't like the miniature style or the colorful miniature style. But I think maybe we'll win them over in the future when we see if they see the depth of the role playing that we actually uh, have. we will we will eventually. Yeah. We but will. but the thing is is that all these people are really excited about, which means there are so many other people out there that are excited about, they just don't know it yet, right? Mm -hmm. And so we want to be able to get the word out there so that they can see for themselves and go, wow, miniatures, wow, dice, wow, it's a really deep CRPG with all kinds of stuff I can do in 3D. I've never seen this. We just want to tell people that. Don't forget incredible characters and writing and a, a reactive world. I think yeah, pretty important stuff. I was trying to figure out what percentage <laughs> this is of your goal. It looks like you're about seven. It's only sixty-three. Let me know. Sixty-three, like man. Sixty-three. Yeah. It looks more than it is. <laughs> oh, so, uh, so hopefully this video. Come on, you guys. So if you're watching, please support us. You're gonna love the game. We only need a couple of those dragon, dragon editions. <laughs> what, yeah. what, what's There's that? About four or five people to spring for the dragon edition, and you're there, right? Yeah, well, unfortunately, well, we there was only maybe one. Maybe made five dragon editions available. Maybe that was our oh. <laughs> mistake. Never mind. Well, it, Matt, if, if you're wanting a drink in the game, and that's the only reason you're considering the dragon edition, I will give you a drink in the game on oh. us. Right? You, you just let me know. You know what I tell? Sometimes I talk to people about Kickstarters, and they say, "Well, I've got. I'm not going to be able to play this game anytime soon. I got a big backlog and something like that." I'm like, "Don't think about it that way." You know, think about yeah, this. Yeah. You're supporting a team. You know, this game, if, if it doesn't get mad, you'll never get to play it. You know? And, and yeah. in two or three years' time, when they don't have anything to play, yeah, if they'd well, backed it and they, they'd had the game, it'd be right there for them, right? They'd be able to put the Dragon's Demand on and have 30-plus hours of incredible CRPG gameplay. I mean, plus, we are releasing stuff in between now and when the game releases. We're giving, we're sending out the coins, for example. That That, you know, that won't be long. We are also... We also have STL rewards, which are 3D printable. So we're making, you know, miniatures, a dice tower that you have there. We have a video there showing that for uh, a dragon on a tower. Uh, we have scenery sets. They'll be getting all this, uh, that kind of stuff throughout uh, 2025, uh, the, the STLs. So there's there's stuff in between now and the game that, that can keep people occupied. Oh, look at that. Let me show this real quick. This is the dice tower. That's the oh, dice yeah. tower. Yeah, and if you go down a little ways, you'll see the uh, the our video on YouTube, where uh, yeah, just a little. There it is, right there, and you can see we spent a lot of time crafting this. It's got the black dragon. It's a parax on the side there. <laughs> you got dice coming oh, out. How cool is that? Yeah, it is cool. And at the end of the video. Uh, our, our art director made this and printed and painted this. You'll see him put a whole bunch of dice down down the top in the hole in the roof there, and they'll all come tumbling out, and it, it works great. Uh, we're really excited about this. Uh, there you go. Yeah. So I go to a weekly board games club, and I think I'll be printing one of these and taking it with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is cool. That's impressive. <laughs> All right, guys. So thanks again. Good luck. I'll hopefully get this. Thanks video. very much, Matt. Thank thanks you. for having us. Thank you for yeah. watching, everyone. Fingers, toes, tails crossed. <laughs> Thank you. We hope so. Yeah. All right. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. And uh, that's all for this week's episode. <laughs> oh. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I should be back next week with a new interview. I'm going to be having the uh, uh, Joseph and Hannah on soon to talk about their Banquet for Fools game, which looks incredible. Uh, so if you have questions, topics, suggestions for those two, let me know. Uh, I've had them on the show before. Magnificent guests. So really looking forward to that. Uh, you know what else is magnificent? You. <laughs> yes, you are magnificent, my friend, because you 
support my show. You keep this channel on the air. And Matt Bradley, Shergi, and I really appreciate your help keeping the uh, show in production, keeping the lights on. Uh, some of you did respond uh, last time. We did the sort of cry for help, <laughs> De desperate pleas uh, for support uh, to keep Matt Chat on. Uh, we're doing a little better, but we could still use your help. So if you haven't supported the show before, please go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. You can sign up for whatever amount of money you like. If you want to do a subscription, you want to do a one-off uh, reward, uh, tip, whatever you want, however you want to think about it, please do that. Uh, if you are at the dollar level, maybe, and that's you've been watching the show for a while, you're not hurting financially, you know, do consider bumping that up to two dollars. You know, you probably won't even notice a difference, but it's, you, know, you know, if enough people do that, we'll be back in the green. Uh, so anyway, uh, don't get me wrong, whatever you do to support the show at whatever level, even if it's just watching and commenting on the show and sharing the link, whatever it is, I appreciate it. And I know Matt does too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And remember, I lost my little cap <laughs> uh, You can't spell gratitude without rat. All right, let's see. Uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Oh, do I have some good news. We've got lots of news. Good stuff. Uh, first up, old buddy, Shane Stacks. Yeah, Shane is back. He's got a, uh, a tip on a game called Monomyth. Now, isn't that something from, uh, not Joseph Campbell. Uh, who's the guy that inspired Campbell? Did all the archetypes. Carl Jung. <laughs> that sounds like a Carl Jungian uh, reference. Uh, anyway, this is uh, not Carl Jung. This is an immersive first-person dungeon-crawling RPG inspired by the genre's late classics. Embark on a journey through a vast and highly interactive game, unraveling the mysteries hidden beneath the ancient fortress of Lysandria. Now, I think this uh, team, the studio, uh, this developer, might have the best name I've ever heard. Rat tower games so i think it's worth supporting just because of the name of the studio uh, uh, but all jokes aside this is only 17.99 it's on steam right now in early access so check it out and i'll see if i can get the developer on to talk about this maybe talk about how he chose such an incredible name for his studio anyway mono myth uh, next up indie retro games or indie retro news i should say great blog is talking there about a game called Ecliptic. This is a turn-based tactical and role-playing game for the Amiga computer. They say it's influenced by Space Crusade, UFO, Enemy Unknown, and the Gold Box Dungeons & Dragons games. Wow. Uh, visually, it's intended to evoke the retro-futuristic science fiction of the 70s and 80s. And they say think aliens, but you know, I was thinking of those Buck Rogers. <laughs> you know, that kind of fits the bill. I guess that's a little bit earlier. Now, well, there wasn't there a Buck Rogers show in the 70s, if I remember that right? Maybe it's early 80s. Anyway, uh, they say they think aliens. Uh, so anyway, that's Ecliptic for the Commodore Amiga. Check that out on Indie Retro News. Uh, and then finally, if you're looking for uh, retro arcade-like games, as well as pretty much any kind of retro genre you could think of, check out UFO 50. This is a collection of 50 single and multiplayer games from a variety of genres, Platformers, shoot 'em ups puzzle games, roguelikes, RPGs. I mean, it's really an incredible collection here. Uh, they've tried to combine the 8-bit aesthetic with new ideas and modern game design. And these are from the creators of Spelunky, Downwell, and Catacomb Kids. And this is uh, from Moss Mouth, is the developer name, and it's only $24.99. <laughs> so what is that, 50 cents a game? <laughs> you know, incredible deal there. And it's got overwhelmingly positive reviews on Steam, so I think it's definitely worth checking out. Pretty sure you guys will like it. There's got to be at least one game in that 50 uh, that you will enjoy. All right, what about that ale of the week? Oh, the ale of the week. Where's my ale? Ah, here we go. You know, and by the way, I, I submitted the name uh, Rat Slayer Stout uh, to the developers there, uh, Alan and Luke. So we'll see if they go with that. I think that'd be a good name for a Pathfinder ale, but we'll see. Uh, anyway, for today, I've got one called Nah. You can see this. It's N-A-H, Nah, Nah, <laughs> Nah. Brewhouse, Brew Lab, I'm sorry, Bauhaus. Well, there's a 
band for you. Remember that Bauhaus? Uh, Brew Labs, non-alcoholic Hells, Hellas. This is brewed right here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Contains less than 0.5% alcohol by volume. Uh, so that means it is a considered a non-alcoholic brew. Yes, YouTube, it's non-alcoholic, so please don't, don't limit my video. Uh, 40 calories, 6 carbs, 0 sugar. Uh, let's see what else we can, I don't see much else here on it. Uh, you know, it's kind of nice. I think that these uh, craft brews should always mention the, the hops they put in there. And the, maybe even the type of yeast. I guess they don't want to give away too many of their brewing secrets, but it would be useful for me uh, to know that. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about here. So you don't want to open it up over there. <laughs> Spiel na all over my lovely quest for the crown. King's Quest game over there. All right, good color on that. Good, good action, good foam, good head, not too much. Some nice bubblies. Oh, smells good. Yeah, very citrusy aroma on that. So they win in the smell department, but let's put some in the old drinking horn. Yeah. Yeah, let's puppy up. Been a while. Now somebody told me that YouTube's been limiting the shadow banning or whatever they call it for anybody that does like ale reviews in their videos that drinks beer, even says the word beer, so I guess I'm already <laughs> screwed, but what the hell? It's kind of my shtick, isn't it? I figure if anybody doesn't want to watch the videos because of this, ugh, well, they've probably been gone a long time. All right. Well, again, smells great in the horn, too. Uh, let me give it a swig. Hmm. Well, there's a lot of flavor in that one. Let's see. What is going on there? <laughs> Not really hoppy. It's kind of piney, citrusy. Uh, oh, it's, it's, a, it's unusual. Let me try it again. Yeah, this one, I don't think I've ever tasted anything quite like this. It's very lemony, almost kind of a lemon rind uh, like flavor to it. A little bit bitter, but not too much, not too bad. You know, I think you need, if you don't have alcohol in a beer like this, you need something in there to put a little punch, a little spice, a little kick to it to substitute for that. Uh, so maybe they're going for that lemon zest. You know, this isn't, maybe a little bit of a grapefruit. So yeah, I would say kind of a grapefruit, lemon rind. It's very, very citrusy uh, flavor on this. You don't taste, it doesn't taste watery, and like some of the NAs do. So it's got that going for it. Uh, probably not my favorite flavor profile, but you know, some people really like that. I definitely don't think you'd be disappointed with this if you're at a party. <laughs> That's what I love about going to parties with the uh, non-alcoholic brews, you know. Uh, you know, everybody's like, well, isn't that your third one? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Boy, I've got tolerance. I'm not even slurring my words much. A little no more than usual. Uh, yeah, so pretty good stuff there. Uh, and let's see, what do I want to give this? I think probably on the non-alcoholic brews, I might go uh, somewhere between three and four on this. You know, I like the... I always like to give them a little bit of an extra point for beers, non-alcoholic beers, where if you didn't know what it was, you wouldn't assume it was an N.A. You know, you'd just think that was a regular beer. So, I, you know, kind of looking at it that way, I'd probably go to four out of five, because um, some of them are really clear that it's non-alcoholic, <laughs> very watery. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when you think about all the worlds of beer, all the stuff out there, you can't really give this, you know, four out of five compared to those. I mean, come on, so... I'd probably go three out of five total, maybe four out of five if we're just limiting it to uh, uh, the non-alcoholic brews. But uh, anyway, definitely not bad. I'd like to see some of their other flavors if they've got some variations on this. Uh, try the whole uh, the whole assortment because that's very promising. All right, let's wrap it up with a quote. And uh, I was looking for quotes about pathfinding and trailblazing and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know if I've used this one before, so forgive me if this is a repeat, but you know, nothing wrong with repeating uh, words of wisdom. Uh, this one goes something like this. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. 
Nice. <laughs> a little quotation there. Kind of makes my hair stand up. It's so good. Uh, a little quotation there by Ralph Waldo Emerson. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoy that, and I'll see you again next time. just made it past one of the minor league teams.